Welcome back to the Emerging Civil War Virtual Symposium. This is our bonus event for the spring, trying to give you some great content here during these plague times that we're suffering through. I'm Chris Mikowski, Editor-in-Chief. I want to give a shout out to Chris White, who's behind the camera today, providing our technical expertise, bringing these videos to you. I also want to give a thanks to Stevenson Ridge, which is hosting us today. Stevenson Ridge is the site of our annual Emerging Civil War Symposium. We're looking forward to being back here this summer, fingers crossed, in August on the first weekend of the month where we will be talking about fallen leaders. You can find out details at our website, www.emergingcivilwar.com. Dot com. Finally, I want to give a shout out and a word of thanks to our friends at C-SPAN who are covering this event. C-SPAN is always excellent to us and we appreciate the work that they do in bringing American history to you. Our next speaker today is one of the newest faces at Emerging Civil War, one of our emerging voices, if you will. John Tracy has worked uh, both at Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park, as well as Gettysburg National Military Park. He's done some fantastic work on the uh, website for us this year, uh, particularly focusing on Gettysburg, but spreading his wings. As he's going to talk today, uh, you can find a rabbit hole and really fall in, and that's what today's topic is today. He's coming to us from the University of West Virginia, where he is just finishing up his master's degree in public history. Ladies and gentlemen, John Tracy. All right, hi. Uh, so today we're going to be spending just a little bit of time uh, on the experiences and in the head of John Rankin, who you see up on the screen there. We've got a picture of him uh, straight out of the regimental history uh, taken when he's a sergeant because he's going to hold a couple different positions that we'll get to uh, alongside a really nice uh, period image, again, from the regimental history uh, of their monument uh, on the Gettysburg battlefield, which again is going to become uh, pretty important as we move along. So John Rankin is serving with the 27th Indiana uh, during the American Civil War. Uh, he's one of the few of his regiment to get through the bloody fighting in Antietam's cornfield without being wounded, uh, though he will be badly wounded in the thigh at the Battle of Gettysburg during that disastrous charge near Spangler Spring on the morning of July 3rd, 1863. Uh, but what we're really focusing on here is that after the war, he later writes a couple short accounts of his service. And these recollect recollections of combat, often very much brutally honest about his experiences, offer a lot of insight into Civil War veterans, how they're remembering their service, and how they want their service to re be remembered by other people. Now, he's also an accomplished printer, a newspaper editor, a foreign language proofreader for the government printing office. He does a lot of things, uh, but he's defining his life a lot less by those successes for decades uh, than one might expect. Instead, he's valuing these three years of service during the American Civil War uh, over all these other decades combined. During the conflict, he's rising from enlisting as a private to being commissioned as first lieutenant and commanding the company he enlists in. But his service, and more importantly, that way that he chooses to write about it and how, rem how he remembered this service in these honest recollections afterwards are going to reveal a great deal about Union veterans. We'll start with his life and that wartime service, and then we'll move into these later recollections. So we have just a blown up image of that picture of him from the regimental, uh, as, long, uh, as well as a cover of that regimental history that he plays a key role in compiling later. Uh, he is born in 1843 to Melissa and Orville Rankin in Greencastle, Putnam County, Indiana. Uh, his father is one of the founders of DePaul University. So he has a bit of a leg up, especially in that education front. And he's going to work to become a printer. And that's a fairly difficult job. That's something that requ requires skill, requires education, and commands some respect. By the time we hit that 1860 census, he's 17, but he's already listed with his occupation as printer. But as we move forward, the Civil War is going to upend a lot of things in American life. And as we hit September of 1861, John Rankin is 18. He's six foot two, weighs about 170 pounds, and he's going to enlist in the Putnam County Grays, which will soon become Company A of the 27th Indiana Infantry. 
So here we have one of the regimental flags for the 27th Infantry, uh, as well as just another great clipping from that regimental history, kind of trying to remind veterans as they read this of some of those more memorable mo moments of service. And I want to take a second to talk about the 27th Indiana because they are in many ways uh, an interesting regiment. Uh, most of them are Scotch-Irish or English, and some, including John Rankin himself, could trace their ancestry all the way back to Puritan immigrants in the 1600s. Uh, one company, though, uh, was fondly recalled as the Dutch Company because they spoke significantly better German than English. But my favorite fact about that is that the people who spoke the worst English had been born in the United States. But despite this, uh, they're very much alike. Most of them are farmers. Most of them don't have the education or technical background that Rankin has. Uh, but they're, they're all those kind of stereotypical, sturdy Western folk. Uh, they're going to earn a bit of a nickname of being the Giants. I mentioned that Rankin measures in at about six foot two, which I know is fairly tall because it's about what I measure in at. Uh, but it's almost common for somebody to be that height in this regiment uh, because they're going to get the distinction of being one of the tallest regiments on average to serve in the Army of the Potomac. Uh, Company G is almost entirely over six feet tall, and some accounts place their captain at around six foot 11. And the rest of the regiment tended to have about 50% or more at or above six feet tall. So I would have to imagine that this is a pretty imposing regiment in line of battle if you're marching out on the battlefield across from them. Now, we're not going to talk about every battle experience that the 27th Indiana has. Uh, if you want to look through that, I highly recommend their regimental history because it is, is very well written. Uh, but I want to touch on their first. So their first battle is the first battle of Winchester in May of 1862, and it is, it is not a great debut showing. Uh, they're going to lose dozens of their soldiers captured in their first engagement. Uh, it's going to be kind of a chaotic debacle all around. Rankin is going to lose a lot of local friends to that uncertainty of prisoner of war life. Uh, but this chaos of combat is going to set a precedent for what some of Rankin's later combat experiences are going to be like. Uh, we're going to focus more on Antietam and Gettysburg and, and kind of brush aside some of their other actions uh, because these are the two that Rankin is going to focus on after the war. So here as we get to Antietam, uh, we have two pictures of their regimental monument there uh, along Cornfield Avenue looking towards Miller's Cornfield itself. And so we have a picture of the marker there kind of looking out into the field as well as a close-up of the inscription upon it. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with the Antietam campaign, uh, it's worth noting that the 27th Indiana is the regiment that will discover Lee's lost orders, that dropped command, uh, indicating all of the movements of the Confederate Army during the campaign. Uh, the soldiers who find that will be from the 27th Indiana, uh, though Rankin is in no way involved in this. Uh, but at the battle itself, in September of 1862, the regiment is going to be engaged in the cornfield and near the West Woods. And again, anyone who has spent some time reading about the Battle of Antietam knows just how bad both those places get. Uh, the regimental history describes it as the most important as well as the most dramatic day in its career because this is the battle at which the regiment has both their largest number of casualties as well as the highest percentage casualties of total strength, uh, as you see on that image there. So on the morning of September 17th, the regiment is leaving uh, their original position near the Pry House. They're serving with the rest of the 12th Corps, and they're moving into a support position as the shattered remnants of regiments engaged earlier in the day begin to stream past them and they are waiting with stacked arms for nearly an hour. They can hear combat. They can see the shattered men and regiments moving past them. And they are just waiting for the order to they themselves be thrown into battle. And Rankin's going to write about that tense moment later. Uh, remembering advancing into this combat, the regimental historian compared the sounds and sights of the battle to the progress of a devastating cyclone. And finally, the 27th and the rest of their brigade are thrown in, in towards the cornfield. So they're standing in open ground, slugging it out with the opposing Confederates in a repeat of 
what most of the fighting near the cornfield has been. They're going to very quickly lose all track of how long they've been out there. They're taking high casualties. They're heavily engaged. They're taking ammunition from their dead and wounded comrades at their feet. And one, one letter recalled that there was scarcely a man on whom blood has not been drawn in some way. As Union reinforcements arrive, they finally fix bayonets, advance into the corn itself, and push aside what's left of the Confederates that were opposing them. And though the Battle of Antietam is going to continue on for several hours past that point, that's going to be the end of the 27th Indiana's combat experiences there. Now, Rankin is one of the few from his company that walk away from that battle without any kind of injury. Of the 440 that are engaged, 209 are casualties. And Rankin is promoted to sergeant following this battle. Uh, and one account states that this promotion is very explicitly due to his bravery in this battle, which is something that you'll want to keep in mind when we get to his memoir of the day. So skipping ahead again to Gettysburg, uh, we see a current image of the regimental monument there uh, in the meadow along Spangler Spring, and then a second image kind of taken from the right of that monument looking towards McAllister's woods. So on July 1st, 1863, the 12th Corps will finally arrive near Gettysburg, near the base of Culp's Hill, uh, but they are arriving too late to take place in the fighting that began north of town that morning. At this point, the 27th Indiana is not fully recovered from battles such as Antietam, and they're down to about 339 men, with Rankin now serving as a sergeant in Company A. Now, as we move into July 2nd, the 12th Corps is going to move towards Culp's Hill and begin assuming defensive positions there. The 27th Indiana and their brigade are going to be set up in McAllister's Woods, as you see in that second photograph. Uh, with the 27th Indiana kind of towards the back right facing towards Rock Creek. And there they're going to kind of dig in and remain for most of the day. Uh, but for those of you familiar with the second day of Gettysburg, uh, you know that fighting that day is not going to begin near Culp's Hill, but will instead begin on the southern half of the battlefield as the Union Third Corps is engaged in places such as the Peach Orchard. And so, the 27th Indiana will be among the units of the 12th Corps that are pulled off Culp's Hill and sent to the aid of Union forces on the southern end of the battlefield. Uh, but in a story very similar to July 1st, uh, they are going to arrive there too late to be of any real use. Now, while they're gone, Culp's Hill is, is defended by a significantly smaller amount of troops and Confederate forces are going to launch attacks against Culp's Hill and begin to seize some lower parts of the hill, including uh, the heights overlooking the Spangler Meadow that would be off to the left of that first image. So the 27th Indiana has slogged their way across the battlefield, uh, probably gotten lost at least once, and now it's getting dark and they need to turn around and backtrack towards their position on Culp's Hill, not knowing that while they were gone, Confederates have launched their own assaults there. The regimental history records, the 27th returned to its former position without delay. As it approached the place where it had formerly been, behind the ledge of rocks, those in advance could discern shadowy forms of men moving about in the darkness. Who they were could not be told. On being challenged, sounds as of splashing water were the only response. It was inferred later that this part of the line had been held by pickets or skirmishers of the enemy, and that upon our return, they had withdrawn beyond the creek. So they are practically stumbling directly into Confederate skirmishers in the dark while they're just trying to make it back to their original positions. So the 27th Indiana is going to spend their night in McAllister's woods facing uh, away along the creek, making sure that those Confederate skirmishers are not going to come back. And so they're not going to get a whole lot of rest that night uh, because they know that the Confederates are practically on top of them. On top of that, uh, Rankin and his company, Company A, are put out as skirmishers along the creek that evening. So he's going to get even less rest than some of his comrades might. So now we move into the early morning of July 3rd. The 12th Corps is obviously not particularly happy that the Confederates have taken some of their old positions on Culp's Hill. 
and their Corps commander, Henry Slocum, has given that order to drive them out at daylight. So you have the 27th Indiana facing away along the creek. You have the 13th New Jersey partially facing the creek and partially lined along the woods you see in that shot. You have the 2nd Massachusetts kind of behind that shot, and you'll, I'll show you guys a map of that a little later. And although fighting uh, is going to begin elsewhere on Culp's Hill earlier in the morning, coinciding with an enormous Union artillery bombardment, uh, as the morning continues on, some accounts state around 9 a.m., uh, the brigade is going to receive orders to attack across the meadow shown in that first image towards the heights now held by Confederates. So Colonel Colgrove is now commanding the brigade, though he is generally the regimental commander of the 27th Indiana itself. And he wrote about receiving this order. And he said that the field before him was so narrow that it was impossible to advance more than two regiments in line. Between the enemy and our line lay the open meadow, about 100 yards in width. The enemy were entirely sheltered by the breastworks and ledges of rock. It was impossible to send forward skirmishers. The enemy's advantages were such that a line of skirmishers would be cut down. The only possible chance I had to advance was to carry his position by storming it. Uh, and some other eyewitnesses said that when Colgrove is receiving this order, uh, he simply says, it cannot be done. It cannot be done. Uh, but then as he resigns himself to this, uh, he continues, if it can be done, the 2nd Massachusetts and the 27th Indiana can do it. The field's too small to send the whole brigade out at once. Um, he can only send the 2nd Massachusetts and the 27th in Indiana, while other regiments, such as the 13th New Jersey or the 3rd Wisconsin, have to sit and watch. Now, the exact time and meaning of this order is something that's going to be debated for a rather long time as veterans try to figure out if it was simply a misunderstood order, whether Colgrove was simply supposed to figure out if the Confederates were still there or how many there were, or if he'd actually been given an order to try to storm them, because they're trying to justify later why it was that they were sent on what is very quickly going to become little more than a suicide mission. Uh, but Colgrove gives this order to advance. Like I said, the 2nd Massachusetts is, is fronting the woods, so they're very quickly able to step out and begin marching directly towards the Confederate positions. But the 27th Indiana is going to have a significantly harder time doing this. Uh, they are facing away. They're facing off to the right against the creek. And they also have to move through the 13th New Jersey. So it's going to take them some time to move away from the creek, change their facing, and literally pass directly through another Union regiment. So things are going to become a little jumbled. It's going to take them a little longer to move out into the field. And because of that, the combat actions of the 27th Indiana and the 2nd Massachusetts are going to very quickly become two distinct actions. Uh, the 2nd Massachusetts is finding itself charging directly towards Stewart's Confederate Brigade, whereas the 27th Indiana is uh, assaulting what is essentially a reinforced stone wall with newly arrived Confederate reinforcements from extra Billy Smith's Virginia Brigade. Uh, Colgrove recalls ordering the attack, writing, at the command, forward double quick, our breastworks were cleared, and both regiments, with deafening cheers, sprang forward. They had scarcely gained the open ground when they were met with one of the most terrible fires I have ever witnessed. So as these two regiments finally make their way into this open, marshy meadow, uh, they're going to be opened up on by Confederates behind rocks, behind trees, behind a stone wall. Rankin wrote, Besides the obstruction of the trees, there were numerous boulders, some at least six feet high. Therefore, when the 27th reached the meadow, its line was entirely broken. The 27th advanced into the center of the meadow when the color bearer was shot down. The remaining seven of the color guard and three men besides fell on that spot, trying to advance the colors. The right and left wings of the regiment, noticing the failure of the center to advance, halted. And thus the 27th came to a standstill in the center of the field. To go forward was certain destruction, as that part of the rebel line against which the 27th charged was over three times the length of the regiment. To stay there was annihilation. So they are stuck in the middle of this field where the Indiana State Monument is today, in the open, facing significantly larger numbers of Confederates. So the assault is blunted, it's going to fall apart, and the regiment is forced to pull back 
towards their original position in the woods. The second Massachusetts, having managed to reach the cover of some trees and rocks of their own, are going to be able to stay out there a little bit longer, but now that they're alone, they're not going to last much longer either. They're going to withdraw as well. And the second Massachusetts and their ability to stay out in that field longer, as well as that split in the attack, are going to be points of contention later. Now at some point in this assault, Rankin is going to be wounded rather badly in the left thigh. And because it's a leg wound, uh, it's really unclear whether he was a, among the men of his regiment that are able to withdraw into the woods, or if he, along with many other wounded of the regiment, are going to be left in this open meadow. And for those left behind in this field, uh, they're facing a very uncertain future. Uh, are they going to be out there until they die of their wounds? Are they going to receive medical attention? Are they going to be captured by Confederates and face prisoner of war life like so many of their friends in the aftermath of the Battle of Winchester? And so these wounded men in the field are being left out there for hours. I apparently didn't change slides for too long. There we go. Uh, and they are beginning to cry out to their friends for help. The regimental history recorded that their outcries from pain and thirst and their direct appeals for help were irresistible. In different instances, they called the names of those who they hoped might take pity on them, sometimes calling one after another of the names on the roll of their companies. More than one of our men, when they heard their names called in this appealing way, could bear it no longer. Leaping over the breastworks like men inspired, they rushed down into the meadow gathered the helpless suffering victim in their strong arms and bore him to a place of safety. Now we often hear that idealized story of Union and Confederate soldiers sharing water at Spangler Spring, uh, but there is no such mercy here. The regimental continues, no one ventured upon such a mission that did not run the gauntlet of a rain of lead. So we get to the story of Private George Bales. He's a, he's a private in Company A, so he is somebody that Rankin has served with for a long time. He is somebody that Rankin, as sergeant of the company, is directly responsible for. Private Bales stands up from the earthworks, lays down his rifle, and rushes into the field to try to recover somebody, probably someone from Company A that he and Rankin knew. He's immediately shot directly through the heart and killed. Now eventually, Confederate forces are going to withdraw from Culp's Hill and join in that greater Confederate retreat from Gettysburg. And in that aftermath, the wounded men of the 27th Indiana, including Rankin, are taken to field hospitals. And those that were able buried the dead along Culp's Hill. One soldier of the regiment wrote, the boys had gathered 28 in one place and dug a long trench, about six and a half feet wide, long enough to lay the bodies wrapped up in their blankets, side by side, with headboards to etch the letters cut in with their knives. Now, Company A was on the flank of the regiment, so they take relatively low casualties. Uh, they, take, they lose two killed and seven wounded, including John Rankin. Regiment enters the battle with about 339 men, lose 16 killed and 139 wounded. That's about 41% casualties. And though that may seem almost on par to some other regiments at the Battle of Gettysburg, it's important to note that other than a handful of casualties that occurred during skirmishing, almost all of those casualties are occurring during this assault. And the regiment is only out in the open meadow for about 20 minutes. So severely wounded in the left thigh, Rankin is taken to the 12th Corps Hospital, likely over at the George Bushman Farm on the west end of Rock Creek and will later be taken to a more permanent hospital in York, Pennsylvania, and then a convalescent camp in Patterson Park, Baltimore. Now, following the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, the 11th and 12th Corps, including the 27th Indiana, will be detached from the Army of the Potomac and sent west to the Army of Cumberland in Tennessee, where they'll fight at battles such as Lookout Mountain in November. Rankin does not return to the 27th Indiana until December of 1863, six months following his wound. In January of 64, Rankin's offered an honorable discharge, but he doesn't take it. He stays with the regiment and earns a promotion to first sergeant. And as we move into the spring of 64, on April 19th, Rankin is commissioned first lieutenant. So he's now an officer as the regiment moves into the Atlanta campaign. 
And during July and August of 64, he's in acting command of Company A. So he is commanding the company that he enlisted in as a private two and a half years prior. And as we move into the fall, he's completed his three-year term of service along with the rest of the regiment. And so he's discharged from the Army on November 4th of 1864. And the 27th Indiana is mustered out of service and those who re-enlisted are transferred to another unit. So as we've seen here, the 27th Indiana has a very active service record. And Rankin and his comrades endured some pretty horrific and stressful combat experiences. One can easily imagine that after trial by fire at Winchester, enormous casualties at Antietam, and a disaster at Gettysburg made worse by being unable to help their wounded for hours in front of them, that veterans like John Rankin were very particular about the ways in which their stories were told. So after his service, he returns home. He buys the, lo the local paper, the Green Castle Banner. He edits and publishes it for a few years. He sells it, starts a successful printing business in Chicago, but has pretty poor timing because he proceeds to lose it in the Great Chicago Fire. Uh, he, he moves to Kansas, publishes a paper there, then finally moves back to Indianapolis and works for the Typographical Union, that large organization for printers such as himself. In 1889, he moves to Washington, D.C. and works proofreading foreign languages for the government. He's mostly successful. Uh, he'll later marry and start a family. But during all this time, no matter where he's moving between, and especially when he is in Indianapolis or Washington, he'll be very involved with veteran organizations, such as the Grand Army of the Republic or his own regimental association for the 27th Indiana. He contributes heavily to that regimental history written by Edmund Brown that I've shown a few images from. And he is listed specifically by name among those as having rendered valuable aid. And as for the monument you see there, he plays an instrumental role in that as well. In 1885, the state of Indiana allots funds for the placement of markers to each of their regiments that are engaged at Gettysburg. And John Rankin is one of four men appointed to superintend the placement of the 27th Indiana's monument. And as the lore goes, the monument is placed on a rock that sheltered wounded soldiers from the regiment as they waited for aid for hours. Theoretically, that could have included John Rankin. And so in 1885, on October 28th, when this monument is dedicated, it is probable that Rankin has come back to the field of Gettysburg, has come back to the field of his wounding to watch as the monument he played a role in placing is dedicated. So that moves us beyond his life and his service uh, into the so what of the program. You know, how does he look back on this later? So honesty is very important to Rankin, whether that's honesty about his personal state of mind or honesty about the conduct of his regiment and the men with whom he served. Uh, this is common among veterans. After the war, they sought to tell uh, the truth about their wartime experiences. But of course, this truth is something that is going to differ between individuals, between units, between what they have seen or what they have felt. Of course, decades after, it may also be influenced by time. But nevertheless, telling this truth or correcting other accounts was very important to veterans like Rankin. So here we have a great image of the aftermath of Antietam from the Library of Congress, as well as a quote from John Rankin's Antietam memoir, What I Thought at Antietam. Now, this is a very vivid account. This is a very detailed account. And despite the fact that these accounts are saying that he was promoted to sergeant in the aftermath of Antietam specifically due to his bravery, this account is all about how scared he was at Antietam. Perhaps this is him trying to grapple with the fact that everybody was calling him brave after Antietam, when in fact he had a very different experience. He opens the memoir. When going into battle, there is a different set of thoughts and emotions for each man. These thoughts are private property and are generally kept locked in each individual breast. All of us at times have thoughts we would not care to have made public, and many good soldiers would feel humiliated to have thoughts made bare which pass through their mind in certain ordeals. So he's offering this memoir of his own personal mental experience at that Battle of Antietam in September of 1862. 
Uh, he recalls when the regiment first moves towards battle, writing, a scene of horror and grandeur is before us. The smoke of the battle, the mist of the morning, steel rested on the field, giving a spectral appearance to objects but a short distance away. Disaster and destruction were everywhere in sight. And he speaks to his own struggles with courage. Another battle now begins. It is the battle which every soldier has to fight within his own breast sometime during his career, and the struggles between conscience and cowardice begin. Not only is he not sure whether the Union will win the Battle of Antietam, but he's also not entirely sure what's going to happen with his own internal battle with fear. He noted that the thoughts of a selfish nature begin to crowd on my mind. I begin to calculate my chances of escape. He is noting that as they move towards battle, he is looking around and trying to figure out how likely it is that he will be able to slip away unnoticed and avoid engaging in combat. How much would I give to be away from here? I would give the results of a life's toil, and I would be strongly tempted to sign away my title to that house not made with hands. He is absolutely terrified. What keeps me here in my place? not honor, but reputation. If I could sneak away, I would be willing to try to settle the matter with conscience. Of course the rebels must be driven back across the Potomac, but the absence of one musket will not make any difference in the general result. I'm about one half Quaker anyhow. He starts to think about, well maybe when combat starts, a lot of my friends are going to be wounded. Maybe I can just help one of them off the field. It'll look like I'm doing a good thing, and I'm going to get away from combat. But he doesn't see an opportunity to. And it's only now that he starts to kind of steal himself, and he remains in this line of battle. But he notes looking around, surrounded by all the other men in his regiment, and noting the immense casualties that they're taking, that the men around him have seemed to stand firm. He writes, everyone standing here has bullet marks on his clothes. From the start, they have stood there awaiting what appeared to be their inevitable doom. My regret is that I am not more worthy to be numbered with them. To all appearances, not one of them has faltered. Well, locked in my own breast is the annoying secret that at the opening of the battle, I did not fully withstand the terrible temptation and was almost ready to acknowledge the independence of the Southern Confederacy. So yes, during this writing, Rankin is overcoming this fear, but I don't think he's writing this memoir to glorify his bravery. He's describing these horrible sights, and he feels really guilty about how afraid he was because he is surrounded by men, including many who are badly wounded or are dead at his feet, that as far as he could tell, never faltered, never had this fear that he did. As we move to his accounts in the aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg, we see some clippings from the National Tribune, including a very helpful map of the battlefield to help you visualize things. Uh, and so you know, A represents the 27th Indiana, as you see they're kind of facing off to the side. Uh, C represents the second Massachusetts, though some accounts tend to have them a little, a little further uh, to the right. And you see that open position in the meadow labeled as E. So the National Tribune uh, is founded in 1877. It's a very popular publication specifically targeting Union veterans. They also had this column, as you see there, titled Fighting Them Over, where veterans could write in and have their own memoirs and accounts of, of their own service published. So by now, popular memory has really set that Gettysburg is the moment of the war. It is the key moment. It is the climactic battle towards that pivotal turning point for Union victory. So everyone wants to write about their role in that battle. They want to tell people what they did at that important moment. But the chaos of battle, the blinding smoke, and the fact that no individual soldier could ever possibly see everything means that every veteran is both experiencing the battle differently and remembering it differently. On Steven Sodergren's chapter, The Voice of the Union Veteran in the Pages of the National Tribune, in the recent edited volume, The War Went On, uh, he explains you know, that veterans are using the Tribune as a way to tell what they call the truth of history. But because this truth is limited by what soldiers could see or how they remembered it differently, there tend to be disputes 
uh, even between these union veterans, even between men that served together, about omissions or mistellings that they perceived in others' accounts. And this second set of Rankin's post-war writings is one such example of this tendency. So Rankin writes to the National Tribune defending the 27th Indiana in a series of articles uh, because he believes that the second Massachusetts is placing blame for the failure of that disastrous assault solely on his regiment. Uh, and most of his complaints are based on the Adjutant General of Massachusetts report for the year of 1863. So this report is, is summarizing what units from Massachusetts did in 1863. And as he's reading the section on the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry, and he's reading the section about the Battle of Gettysburg, the official report is stating that the 2nd Massachusetts was stuck in that field alone because, quote, the regiment on the right falls back in disorder earlier in the assault. So the attack is pretty chaotic. Like I said, it splits into two actions very quickly, and there was nothing that either regiment could possibly have done to help the other one out. And yes, the 27th Indiana did withdraw from the field first, uh, but this report to many looks like it's placing the blame solely on the 27th for the failure of the attack and the casualties that the 2nd Massachusetts is taking. And as one might expect, Rankin is not very happy about this. So in 1892, he's writing a series of articles to the Tribune. Uh, it's worth noting that this is only seven years after the placement of the monument. So he's got a fairly fresh trip to Gettysburg in his mind. And he's arguing that the 27th Indiana is not directly to the right flank of the 2nd Massachusetts and that they're two separate actions. And this is when Rankin writes that earlier quote, to go forward was certain destruction, as that part of the rebel line against which the 27th charged was over three times the length of the regiment. To stay there was annihilation. So the 27th fell back about the same time the 2nd Massachusetts retreated. He doesn't think that this blame is fair because both regiments were pinned down. Neither could succeed, neither could help each other. It's just that the 27th Indiana was left in the open of that meadow while the 2nd Massachusetts had at least some form of cover. He continued, to describe this affair so as to convey the idea that the 27th and 2nd started in line together and that the 27th ran off and left the 2nd to bear the brunt alone makes the conduct of the 2nd appear glorious but it is not true. A regiment has no more right to counterfeit glory, glory derived from misstatements, than a man has a right to counterfeit money. Uh, so Rankin is very clearly seeing this as an opportunity for the second to claim glory at the expense of the 27th. And he sees this as a broader trend of the regiment. He claims that the extract quoted from that adjutant general report is only one of the many left-handed compliments the 27th has received from the 2nd Massachusetts, and every one of them is founded on misstatements. So not only are these both Union regiments, but they served next to each other in the same brigade for years. But instead of supporting each other, they're arguing it out on the pages of a veterans magazine. Another article written later in the series by an eyewitness in the 3rd Wisconsin uh, tried to calm things down a little bit, saying it's only a small grievance and either regiment has plenty of glory so that they don't need to rob one another. Uh, but Rankin only seems to get angrier as these columns continue. Um, this report was not only unfair but slanderous. He claims that if it was true, uh, the 27th Indiana would have meekly borne all that has been said, but the statement being at variance with the facts, we protest against it. Now, ultimately, this will be somewhat resolved. At least one member of the 2nd Massachusetts will write in to the National Tribune uh, in defense of Rankin and the 27th Indiana, writing, Comrade Rankin is right, I think, in saying that the 2nd Massachusetts and 27th Indiana did not enter the meadow in line together. The 27th Indiana, 3rd Wisconsin, and 2nd Massachusetts fought side by side in a good many battles and were great friends. So don't let us quarrel anymore. And as we take a look at modern scholarships, generally this attack is shown as a doomed mistake, a failure in the command structure, and doesn't place blame for this disaster on the fighting men of either of these regiments. Uh, so here we have his burial 
a calling card for the GAR showing just how involved he was in these veterans organizations, as well as a later in life photograph uh, published with one of his obituaries. So John Rankin dies suddenly at his home in Washington, D.C. in October of 1910. He's 63. He leaves behind his wife, Margaret, and three children. And that grave you see is in Arlington National Cemetery. His memorial statement in the typographical journal, the, uh, the publication for that union he used to work for, reads in part, in the death of John R. Rankin, a well-known and longtime employee of the government printing office, a splendid character has disappeared. It heaps praise upon his decades of work in the printing profession, but it also spoke of something that he did for only three years, quoting that he had an excellent record as a soldier. And that mention of war experiences as an obituary is important. Rankin values that time a great deal, like many veterans. When he writes after the war, he's writing for truth, personal truth about his great fear at Antietam, or truth through the vindication of the sacrifices that he and his regiment made at the Battle of Gettysburg. He's not just writing either of these things for glory. Though some might argue that that Gettysburg narrative is written to make their defeat look less bad or salvage reputation, I don't think that's really what's at work there. Rankin sees the claims of the second Massachusetts as disingenuous. He knows the 27th Indiana lost. He knows they lost badly. He was wounded pretty badly in the attack himself. He knows the second Massachusetts lost, but he doesn't think it's either of their faults. When taken in as a whole picture with that memoir of Antietam, it shows a man who thought his memories of battle important, whether personal or a little more on the logistics side. And he wanted people to understand what he felt and what he saw at these battles. Whether that was a deep look into his fear or to understand that he and his comrades tried their best at Gettysburg, he wanted his version of the truth shared. Thank you. <laughs>